Um, so this is a failure after failure talk. We're going to be talking about a bunch of things, including CouchDB. Um, my name is Tim Anglad. I work for Cloudant. Um, you may know a couple other projects I help with. Uh, one of them is NoSQL Summer, and the other one is NoSQL Tapes. Who has ever been involved or seen any of those? Can we get a show of hands? One, two. Um, so right now I'm a community manager and developer advocate at Cloudant, um, a CouchDB hosting company. Um, and we're here to talk about failures, um, mostly exemplified through our own experience developing an open source distributed database um, version of CouchDB that we call Big Couch. Um, before I start, can I get another show of hands on people who know about CouchDB? Okay. Um, people who have used CouchDB. People who have used Cloudant. Nice. I'd give you a high five, but you're too far. After, a hug. I'll give you a hug. So I'm not going to be giving too many details about CouchDB. Uh, but let me start about Cloud and the company. Uh, Cloud was founded by three MIT grad students, um, Alan, Adam, and Mike, um, who went through um, some physics projects trying to store and analyze a lot of data. Um, they thought the thing they came up with was pretty interesting, so they applied for YC in the summer of 08. They got in, um, they got the company funded. Um, now we're about two years later, three years later. Company in Boston with employees around the world. Uh, we have two main lines of, of products. One of them is the hosted CouchDB service that we provide, and the other one is to sell licenses of or um, you know, private technologies to large customers. Um, so the open core project is Big Couch. That's what we're going to talk about today, uh, and the rest uh, available as license. So it's kind of the usual model for uh, most database companies these days. Uh, very quickly, CouchDB is a document database. Um, this is what a document looks like. It's JSON with types, uh, example with dates over there. Uh, you can have attachments, uh, audio files, image files, anything like that. It doesn't go as a blob like in like MySQL. Uh, it's just stored in the file system. You can handle complex relationships and hierarchies uh, with arrays, with ashes, anything like that. And you have multi-version concurrency control uh, with IDs and revisions. Um, other basics very quickly. The database is written in Erlang. Um, main API is the usual um, get, post, delete, put um, that you use in HTTP. Uh, you have several APIs on top of that, including a change feed that lets you see all the stuff that's happening on your DB. Um, the core storage is an epin only B3. Uh, that means that you need to run compaction on it every now and then. And indices are done through MapReduce views that are actually written to disk and permanent. So if you query, if you do the same query twice, you're not going to have to wait uh, as long as the first time. You're just going to read it from disk. Um, and those are mostly expressed in JavaScript, although KGB supports Ruby, Python, and a bunch of other languages to write those MapReduce views. Uh, we get asset properties at a single document level, but nothing beyond that. Um, so let's go back to talking about Cloudant and BitCouch. Um, the main statement I want to be clear about is that we have failed repeatedly at Cloudant, um, and we're not necessarily proud of that, um, but it's the reality of it. Um, now, it depends what you consider a failure. Um, if you look at all the support tickets that people have opened with us, we failed about 12,000 times. Um, we failed free users. Uh, we, failed, we failed large paid customers. And personally, I don't know a single company that hasn't failed. Uh, not necessarily as often as we have, but um, I also don't know a single company that won't admit it has failed. So I'm here to admit that we have failed. We probably have failed you, maybe, if you used us. Have we failed you? Not yet? It's coming. <laughs> and this is about sharing some of the mistakes we've made. Uh, this is about. Um, Explaining how complex distributed systems can be, um, even if you have you know, smart people in, in your company. It's about, help, about helping you learn from our experience and maybe encouraging you to try and fail and get back on your feet and go up again. And again, we're not proud of our failures. Some of them like, still wake us up at night. Um, and I'm just choosing this very self-deprecating approach because um, I was looking at the schedule and I saw a lot of, might I say, self-serving talks and pitches, and I figured that you'd probably be tired of that after two days. So hopefully that will work a little bit better. Um, so let's, let's, talk, let's talk about how we try to make users happy, and let's see how we fail them and eventually try to make them happier. So back in 2007, as I um, quickly 
discussed. Um, or three founders were trying to track collider experiments. So that's the kind of data where they just smash atoms together, you get, well, smash molecules together, they get billions of atoms and parts of atoms flying around and a bunch of stuff like that to track. And you have to track every single one of them for every millions or billions of a second for several seconds or minutes. Uh, and so that generates a lot of data very quickly. And so they looked around, couldn't find anything, the usual story. Um, they come up with the most horrible sentence in the world. The world needs a database that do, does what we want to do. And um, they looked at viable you know, databases up there, and Couch was very appealing to them, CouchDB. Um, the problem with Couch is that back then it was still very early, um, and its motto was still like cluster of vulnerable commodity hardware, a very resilient database. Um, the problem was that it didn't do the cluster part. So that's problematic if you really want to go and scale to you know, more than the disk you can handle, uh, if you want to handle partition tolerance. Um, and you know, they really like the core of it, the REST interface, uh, the relative maturity for a new project, the so 68 years in, and the large community that KGB already had around it. So Big Couch came about with the statement of putting the C back in CouchDB. Um, and, you know, at the time, we were like, yeah, we're starting a new code project. That's always fun, right? That's always a good idea. In a lot of ways, that may have been, and eventually, you know, people are going to be the judge, that may have been our first failure. Because there are plenty of databases out there, especially today. Um, I am try to be involved in the community, and I'm on a bunch of program committees up at conferences. And the amount of talks we get about, like, oh, here's this new DB I created. It's cool. Like, it's, it's fine to have fun. Um, but at this point, we're on overdrive. Um, back in 2000, 2007, 2008, maybe it was better. Uh, but now it's really the acronym my friend I've coined for it is yet another wonking NoSQL solution. Yawns. So please don't make me yawn. Please don't make the rest of the community yawn. If you have something that's worth doing, do it. Go ahead, release it. Otherwise, just have fun in your garage. Uh, but don't, don't do another database and that's really, 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 really needed. So we, we set out to do this thing and we started to do yet another solution. And the first thing is we want to go distributed, right? The whole thing is clustering. And distributed systems are hard, very hard. Wes tried to code, code a distributed system or is coding a distributed system. No, I mean real ones, not like React. Um, and so you want to do distributed, right? And so you look at the literature out there and the Dynamo paper that came out, so just Dynamo, fantastic. And so uh, Werner Vogel, the CTO at Amazon, uh, pushed for that paper to be released. But it was just a paper about this Amazon technology uh, with concepts, references to algorithms they were using, but no actual code. And so as most great people are, the founders were lazy. So they look at the code out there, and the code out there is called Dynamite. And it's made by this guy called Cliff Moon, who just did the first open source implementation of Dynamo. And um, Cliff Moon is someone you should never follow on Twitter, ever. Don't do it. Really, don't look at his profile right now. Never. But um, he put this code out in Erlang, which was perfect. KGB was Erlang. Um, and that had the core implementation of Dynamo, a good starting point. And so it's like, wow, you know, we're using prior art, prior paper, prior code. That's a good idea, right? We think it's a good idea. Okay, you're learning. Failure number two, using prior art. It's very danger dangerous to disregard prior art. It's very dangerous to use prior art. And mostly when it comes to code specifically, it's because your project is different from my project. Different trade-offs, uh, no underlying knowledge of you know, what's going to be plugged in. So Dynamite was kind of its own thing, its own key value store. And you know, it, didn't, it wasn't designed for KGB underneath. Um, you know, all this stuff like shard membership, uh, node status, all that stuff that KGB could have kind of handled internally, we kind of were pushing that onto Dynamite. That wasn't necessarily working well. And so you know, we ended up ripping out most of Dynamite code um, out of our system. The other problem is the quality of code. Uh, Cliff is a, a great developer. Um, I think this was his first Erlang project um, that he eventually abandoned because of uh, time and license issues. And so, you know, uh, not a good 
ship necessarily to build your, your product and your company on. So we ended up creating Memsory, the first kind of sub-project for Big Couch. Um, that was just, let's just write or shard mapping and, or distribution directly into CouchDB, in Couch database rather, and we're just going to use standard replication algorithms that are in CouchDB to pass that around the cluster and everything works fine. Now the next problem obviously is distributed systems mean distributed tasks, right? You're not necessarily on the right node, and so you want to make sure that you pass off whatever information or whatever task there is to execute from node to node. And executing remote code is complex, it's um, relatively shitty, and we spend an inordinate amount of time working on it in programming and computer science in general. Uh, that's a totally scientific study that proved it. I'll find the quote somewhere. Uh, so, you know, we're like, okay, let's not go there again. Let's not be architecture astronauts. Erlang as a fantastic RPC mechanism. So we're just going to use it. That's a good idea, right? It's not. It's not because the Erlang RPC library, which is, you know, perfect piece of software, but just, again, not the right trade-offs for us. Uh, it's not designed for heavy parallelism. It's not designed for, like, a ton of thousands of requests coming in at the same time. Uh, it spawned a bunch of processes for everything because, again, it assumes that it's not in a heavy parallel situation. And um, it tends to direct the, the, the responses through a single process. So that process blocks. It's impossible to get out of it. We couldn't find a way out of it. We just ripped a bunch of code out of it. Um, remove a bunch of safeguards. Um, and, you know, again, being aware of what we're doing. Remove middlemen. Remove remote processes. Uh, do the signaling out of band, and we call that Rexy, and it served us pretty well. Um, the first version had like a two times throughput improvement, again with straight offs in terms of security, but it was probably the best decision we did at the time of like, let's reinvent the wheel we have to at this point. So meanwhile, um, the project is advancing, and we start having customers and deployments, and our code base is growing with those. Right? We get requests. We get people saying, like, oh, I need this. I need this yesterday. And so, you know, we're a startup. We're a small company, small team. So what do we do with Scrum? And Scrum is a good idea, right? <laughs> really? Am I that obvious? I guess I am. So failure number four. You iterate often, you iterate fast, and eventually you're going to hit the wall. Um, and that's because it's just not manageable to do Scrum for a long period of time and always you know, try to do the, uh, stories and always respond to customer requests. So I think at some point, I wasn't at the company back then, but at some point the CEO just blew a fuse, went into hiding for like two months, ripped all the code apart, rewrote uh, a, a big part of it, and created Fabric, the third kind of pillar for Big Couch, which is just an abstraction layer for all the database operations. Um, we used to be really, really close to the HTTP interface, so we'd, we'd handle stuff directly as a get, as a put, as a post. We just abstracted everything as just simple DB operations. Uh, and we get a nice, clean Erlang interface with no awareness whatsoever of HTTP, in case you know, in the future we want to have a binary interface, something like that. And all the quorum logic, the distribution, the merging of the views, all that stuff, it's in Fabric. So meanwhile, that the problem with having customers is that they keep growing. And around the same time, we start opening up our shared hosting platform. So we just like, okay, instead of working for one of customers in private beta, we're just have, gonna have this fantastic, large, shared platform. People could just sign up, their instance is created in seconds, they can start doing puts and gets. It's gonna be awesome. And so our CEO never said that, but I think he really thought about it for a while. And, you know, Especially back then, again, this is like 2008, I think. What do we do? We go for EC2 for hosting. Because using state-of-the-art cloud hosting is the right idea, right? And no, it's not. So I call that Amazon Lull services because they give you all the lulls you can ever want. Um, they have Elastic Lulls computing, Elastic Lulls storage, and more important than everything, Elastic Lulls support. Uh, so specifically, EC2 is a good enough service, it's fine. Um, elastic block storage in very short in 30 seconds is just, it's just a mess, don't do it. It's like crack, just don't go there. Don't, don't get that first taste. Uh, it looks good on paper, I'm sure they could have pulled it off better, I'm sure they're working on a replacement for it. Um, it just fails. 
Um, it doesn't even fail, actually. It's worse than that. It gets so slow without failing that you can't even, at your monitoring system, say, like, oh, that drive failed. Let me replace it because it's still alive. But it's only giving you, like, one operation per second. Um, and so you have to deal with it. You have to build that into your system. Uh, you can't trust um, what the support system says to you, or the monitoring system from Amazon says to you, because they pretend everything is fine, nothing is happening, you're the problem. Um, and so you have to spend an inordinate amount of time assuming that every single part of your hardware is going to fail. And that's a great thing. It's the best kind of smoke test you can have on your distributed systems. Uh, it's an experience I would recommend. Uh, hopefully not with a bunch of users, depending on your service. But AWS sucks, and in a way, it's really good. Uh, so meanwhile, again, keep growing. Um, and for anybody who's kind of been dealing with KGB at any scale, um, you start learning about KGB's biggest problem, which is disk size and compactions. So I'm not going to explain what compactions are because I don't have the whiteboard and I have the, the drawings for it. But the idea is your data grows as you do deletion, updates, whatever, because it's over every copy, and then sometimes you need to compact to remove all the old copies of the data. That's fine, except compaction sucks in CacheDB. It's the worst part of the system by far. And um, that's fine when you have a single like, little CacheDB install, um, and you maybe never have to compact. But when you're running shared cluster with like thousands of users on them, you start amassing data very, very fast, and you start having to compact really often. And so you start compactions on the cluster. And all users complain at the same time, because everything becomes slow. And so what do you do? You know, you try to be a good citizen. Um, you start writing a patch. You rewrite compaction for CouchDB. You submit it to the CouchDB project at Apache, and you wait for it for inclusion, right? So you can then, you know, merge the trunk version, well, the release version of KGB back into your own code base and go forward. Um, because that's about being a good open source citizen, right? And then you wait. And then you wait. And then you wait. And so the failure here is having too much trust in Apache. Don't get me wrong, I think Apache is doing a lot of good. Um, but Apache is not about what you want to do. And again, it never should be. Uh, it's about you know, project leaders want to do, what users in general want to do. It's about finding the best mainstream solution. And it's probably not going to go your way all the time, or even any time at all. Um, so wanting to be upstream compatible with KGB, it's great, it's perfect. But you can't wait on them to kind of agree with you or take your stuff or even have time to look at it. So you do what is right for you, which is you fork that part of the project, and you maintain that fork. Uh, compaction wasn't the only thing, actually. There were a bunch of other stuff that we're still waiting for inclusion in CouchDB, even though we have members um, you know, on the, the committee there. So we'll see. It's just a diff it's complicated trade-off. So meanwhile, again, shared customer user base and private customers keep growing. And the problem is that they don't only grow in numbers. They grow in uh, demands. Um, it's not just toy projects anymore. It's production apps, uh, large deployments of like several dozens of nodes. And they want reliability, they want uptime, they want everything. And it's still an experimental technology, right? All of those NoSQL solutions are. So what do you do when you don't know what can go wrong? What do you do? Ops experts at React. Yes. But first, <laughs> what do you do? You monitor. And you create those fantastic dashboards that track everything. Disk usage, IOs per second, network activity memory, like latency, everything. Right, it's, it's so clear, right? You can tell. This is LC, right? Is it? I'm not sure. I think it is. There are like four more screens of that on our monitoring page. And that's only like one part of our system. We have multiple alert systems. Um, we have relays for messaging. We have uh, cell phone alert systems with backups. We have operation roles. We have everything. Because really, you know, automating your monitoring is a good idea, right? I guess not. Because there is no such thing as automated monitoring. So what ended up happening, I'm going to go back to my, uh, my big slide, is that we were keeping track of all of that. And every time any of those goes beyond normal, even slightly, we get like an alert system. And people get woken up and start you know, hacking their computer. And so one day, I have a customer waking me up at, I think it's like 1 AM, 2 AM. 
And I'm like, what's wrong? And he's like, well, my entire cluster is down. And I'm like, I look at my phone. I'm like, I don't see anything. I don't see any alerts. Everything is fine. He's like, no, no, my, my cluster has been down for two hours. I'm like, oh, OK. And what ended up happening was you could not access the cluster through the HTTP interface. Like if you did like a simple curl get on the home URL of the CacheDB instance, you wouldn't get a 500. And that's the only thing we didn't check in our system, which is stupid, right? It should be the first thing you check. But you're always going to forget something. If it hadn't been that, it had been something else. And if you put too much trust in an automated system and think like, OK, I can go to sleep. Like Nobody needs to be watching the servers. Everything is fine. You're going to end up having some hole in your system and not knowing about it and having a pissed off customer wake you up at 2 AM. So that part of it, again, sounds obvious. Um, I think the real saying here is that um, it's about putting too much trust and thinking you're, all, you're always fine. You're never fine with distributed systems. Something will break, and you need people watching it. So meanwhile, again, our customers, I hate them. They keep like demanding stuff. And then they give us money, and we don't know what to do with it. And so we, our user base, becomes split. And so we have, at this point, this is today, we have roughly two user bases. We have one that's um, very large customers that want their own cluster that we do manage for them. Uh, and they're very knowledgeable, in particular of distributed systems. Uh, they have very high demands and very high constraints. And on the other hand, we have um, shared hosting customer. We tend to be much smaller. Uh, they do like one-off apps, prototypes, a very, very small website or backups. And they just want, like CouchDB, and they just want it hosted easily, right? They don't, have, don't want to have to bother with it. And so my question to you is, of those two user bases, which one would you rather serve? Large users, can you get a good show of hands? Would you rather deal with large users who know their shit? Wow, MongoDB says yes. I can't believe that. <laughs> Sorry. And I uh, would rather be dealing with a bunch of small users. OK, I guess I got two votes for each. And the silent majority. So I'll, I'm going to give you two stories very quickly to um, kind of explain. Uh, Ear is one of our large users, and he's been with us for a long time, and we love them to bits. And they're like, there's a critical issue, we need it fixed. And we're like, oh, we have a patch for you. It's fine. Uh, we're going to deploy it right away. We just need to shut off your cluster, put the patch in, reboot. And like, no, you can't do that. I need my database to stay up at all times. So we're like, OK. Um, we're going to try to do a rolling upgrade, right? We bring one node down, we patch it. We bring it back up, we bring the next node down, we patch it, et cetera, et cetera, until we get all the nodes. And they're like, no, you can't do that. And the reason is because they operate at max capacity. So even bringing one node down would really affect their availability and their throughput. And so we end up having to devise a way to do live code upgrades. That is, while the system is running with Erlang, you patch the code so that next time the function call, it operates the new code rather than the old code. It's a pretty awesome thing to do, but it's pretty difficult to do. So that's a large user demand. A small user demand is some guy, actually from Germany, that comes to us one day, and again, he signs up on the website. We don't know about him. And he starts dumping gigabytes of data on us. And that's, that's still considered small for us, or that's OK. And so that's fine. We're like, OK, we see activity coming in. We're like, cool. And then we'll notice that he's not paying us. He's still in a free plan, free trial plan. So like, OK, they'll pay us. That's fine. No worries. And then he starts doing the most stupidest thing ever, which is to create a bunch of indices on everything. And only is he creating a bunch of indices that he doesn't need, that we know he doesn't need, because we start talking to him. He does it in the most convoluted way ever with his JavaScript code. And instead of using built-in functions that you know, get um, translated to Erlang directly and go really, really fast, he starts running like very archaic, complex JavaScript functions to do complex mathematic calculations. And so we're like, hey, no, 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 no. we can help you. Like, we're just going to review your views, and it's fine. And he's like, no, don't touch my code. Don't help me. I'm like, OK. And we're like, uh, you mind paying for this stuff? Because right now, you're kind of running some cluster into the ground with that stupid stuff you're doing. And he's like, no. I'm just stringing you out. And he tried it out for like, he wants like a trial extension, stays with us for two months, three months, keeps doing that stuff, and then he leaves. 
We never got a cent from him, but he did make us learn a few things. And I guess the lesson here is two things. You want to always, always hope your users are smart. Smart users can be like demanding, but they always push you in the right direction. But you got to be prepared for like when they're really, really stupid and really, really mean to you. Um, and that's the general thing. Um, there is no good solution between you know, being at the mercy of like very large users who control a large part of your cash flow as a company or, or your design direction as a project uh, versus like being subject to thousands of very first small users who won't do very different things and not help or pay a cent. Um, it's an unsolved problem, but you gotta be ready for the latter part. You can't always expect them to do the right thing. So I guess that brings me to the recap. And again, um, just rehashing. So the first rules, I think, to me are lessons that are coding tips in general. Um, they apply to everything, but specifically distributed system is kind of the first thing that you hit. The first, this, uh, fifth one is a testing tip, in a way. Um, instead of writing unit tests, just put your stuff on Amazon, and you'll know soon enough whether or not it fails. Uh, learn that Apache and other you know, open source projects and institutions can do wrong. Um, Learn that monitoring is a never-ending battle. And the last one is a user tip, right? And I said at the beginning that, um, you know, for us it was all about trying to make your users happy and failing them and then trying to make them happy again. And, you know, the one thing I kind of want to leave you here is that you can't, again, expect them to understand all that stuff you go through in the back. Um, like, either understand you know, the complexity of what you're doing or, you know, why it took you so long to do it or why you're doing it that way. Um, you can't expect them to be happy about you, about what you do, even when you try to do right by them. And um, at Cloud, you know, we, we're, we're kind of happy to have uh, the users we have, um, and they expect great, great things of us, and in turn, that makes us great. But sometimes um, they're even nice to us, and that, that makes our day. Um, and so that's it. I'm just going to give you um, news and plugs for Cloud and the rest of the website. Um, we're going to have Big Couch 0.4 available soon um, with more package deployments, maybe GeoCouch integration later in the year, not in 0.4. Uh, you can try everything at clown.com. We have a free plan. Or you can get the code source for Big Couch, distributed version of CouchDB on GitHub. Forks and patches, do everything you want. And of special interest to Europe, um, we're going to have a European cluster soon. Right now we have clusters in the U.S. and in Asia. So if you want... Um, us to fail you, uh, we could do that pretty soon. So just go to the page and reserve a spot and we'll get there. And so that's it. Uh, all the details, if you have any questions, uh, you can ask them now or you can ask them later. Uh, at Cloud on Twitter and my personal account is at Tim on Glad. And if you have any questions, let's go. Okay, first, thanks to the speaker. Question time. I covered everything. There are no questions. <laughs> These are not the questions you want to ask. <laughs> no questions at all? Yeah, seems like you covered everything. Oh, everybody's Great. tired, I guess. Oh, oh there's we a do question. have one. So you mentioned Big Couch was open core. Mm -hmm. what, what are the kind of features you're holding back from the So the features we're holding back are stuff that's um, been asked specifically to us by a certain customer uh, and that we've not seen pop up again. So one example of that is the uh, one feature we have in closed source is an IO queuing system that allows you to throttle any type of operation, any type of user to certain levels. So that when we have that guy, for example, was during a bunch of very stupid views, we can keep it on the side. Uh, or if we want to run compaction at a much higher priority, even if it slows everything down, we can do that. But in general, keep it really, really low. So we can keep it running in the background without bothering the usage levels for other people. So that's the kind of stuff that, you know, again, very specific. Most people wouldn't need it. And you know, that's why we try to stay in business on. I, th I thought you also had things like uh, chained MapReduce and searching. And chained like MapReduce that. is one of them. Search is another one of them. Uh, search is more general. Search, we're going to see. It's not, it's not done yet. We're still in private beta on it. We'll come to a decision whether or not we open source it, but it's probably going to be closed source for a little while at least.
because again, it's a competitive advantage. We try to be good citizens, but stuff like that. You can use Lucene to do search for free on your big couch or on CouchDB, so we're going to try to see you know, about this one. And chain map reduce, same thing. Only one customer ever asked for it, so we have it for them, and you know, we, we sell it sometimes to people, but yeah. Yes? Because, obvious, because obviously um, Amazon sucks. Uh, what did you pick instead, or did you just purchase your own data center? So somewhere in the middle uh, of that. Um, so the first thing is that we still are on Amazon in large parts. We just got to a point where we kind of know how they can fail us on average and how we can get around that. Um, and we're just trying to hedge by having uh, redundancy across multiple data centers and then progressively move every new cluster we set up to different providers. Um, so we have some clusters right now on SoftLayer uh, where they just, we just you know, buy racks from them um, and we use their connectivity and we're happy with them even when their uh, data centers disappear off the map like they did last weekend. But uh, for most part, you know, we're just trying to have good performance out of a single machine. We know that all of them are going to go down at some point. That's not what we're really worried about. We're worried about degraded level of performance and having support we can trust. And so Amazon is, sucks specifically in those respects, having consistent performance and having a support you can trust. Any further questions? Okay. And again, I, I want to make clear, like I think they've done a great job. I could never have done it. We were all sure that we could never have done Amazon. It's just a very difficult game. It happens not to work for what we want to do. And that's all I want to say. I, I tease them, but uh, I kind of really hope they don't kill my instances because I said that. <laughs> okay, then again, thanks for the interesting talk.